here is uh, this highly respected, soul-stirring, tender singer-songwriter of a man by the name of Tom Driscoll. He's also a talented writer. He happens to be married to visual artist Denise Driscoll, who is a contemplative, breath-catching creator of paintings, sculptures, and multimedia art. She recently curated an art installation that was nominated for the Boston Art Award. Now, Denise has worked with artist and sculptor and Holliston neighbor, Michael Frassinelli. In fact, she invited him to include some of his intricate, scientific, spiritual, scientific and spiritual, right next to each other, and whimsical, I like that one too, <laughs> pianista structures in the aforementioned art installation nominated for the Boston Art Award. We've got that in twice, yes. Um, Michael's wife, Katie Frassinelli, was there cheering them all on at the opening, just like he cheers her on at her open mic and coffee house features, where she often performs her gorgeous, heartwarming songs at many of the same venues frequented by Mr. Tom Driscoll. So goes the circle of art, which sometimes makes this world a smaller and more wonderful place. Here's to the many good intersecting circles of life and art. There is a basket back by the coffee and pastries where you may deposit your donation, thanking these wonderful features for their hard work and for coming here today to share it with us. So let's begin. Denise Driscoll grew up in South Carolina, spending her childhood reading making forts, and exploring the nearby woods. She went on to work 20 years as a graphic designer. Presently, her artistic work includes her paintings, multimedia art, and installations, and these have been exhibited in many galleries throughout New England. One of the things that Denise cherishes most in creating her art is the storytelling and the comfortable conversation that happens when many hands share the building of a work of art. We look forward to all that she has to share with, with us, with her images and her words. Please help me welcome Denise Driscoll. Words are not my first um, choice in, in ways to communicate with people, but I'll do my best. Um, I, I traveled to Italy with a group of artists and when I returned, I dreamed that I found a room in the back of my studio that I had never noticed before. In this room was a lovely tapestry suitcase that I had forgotten to unpack. The bag was filled with beautifully wrapped little packages, gifts that I had forgotten that I had carried home from my family and friends. The joy of finding these gifts flowed into my waking life and I knew that this was a true dream. I hadn't connected this dream with my actual work until I was preparing this talk. But much of what I have done since then involves packets, bundles, and envelopes made with paper and fabric. They may be transparent or opaque. They're often arranged in a grid. Sometimes they're folded by others or by myself. They might be sealed with paper, with plaster, paint, and beeswax, or connected and held closed with twine. They may hold nothing but light, or be filled with materials such as cornmeal, wheat, salt, and coffee, herbs and stones, or petals. They might be filled with wishes, secrets, or dreams. Hundreds of Tom's haiku. They might be arranged randomly, or purposefully, or simply painted to please my own eyes. I'm not a terribly social creature, yet I find myself pursuing art that has a social element. 
My work is often only complete when others add their energy, their ideas, their dreams, and their wishes. I may ask others to stamp a word on fabric and add it to a pocket. The taller people could fit the higher pockets. <laughs> Sometimes phrases are collected that are woven into a blanket. People may add written dreams to a web or tell the stories of their dreams to each other. They might stamp words for something they're ready to leave behind and tie them to a braided web of discarded clothing or read hundreds of haiku that are tucked into a wall of envelopes or add one small change themselves. The desire to have people add to my work with their bodies and their cumulative effort is one I've been unable to escape, even though it sometimes feels sloppy and out of control. When my son was little, he consistently resisted all of the plans we made to fill his week with sports and other activities. Sometimes I wondered if we should push him. In reality, he was actively protecting the time he needed to pursue his own activities, which involved reading, thinking, dreaming, and, and doing nothing. A few years later, when I had my first studio, I would come home at the end of the day and I'd be embarrassed to admit that I had spent most of the day sitting on my table and looking out the window. I wasn't sitting and thinking because I was paralyzed by indecision or lack of, indir or lack of direction, but, but I was in the grip of a state of being that I had avoided um, all through high school, college, through working as a young adult and as the mother of young children. The idea of a reflective life is alien in our age of multitasking, hyper-digital connectivity. I use technology every day to access people and information, but I'm also aware of the constant management these tools require and the tendency to, um, they have to keep my thoughts on the surface. I fight that sense of disembodied communication that eliminates the handshake, body language, tonality, and eye contact. This need to remain physically connected to the world and to other people often drives my work. I offer moments where people might focus, take a deep breath, do nothing, sleep, relax, play, dream, share, congregate, and simply listen. I believe that humans, by nature, are visionary creatures. I see evidence of this in all of our wishes that something might be different. The futures we create might have their beginnings in those wishes. After folding and tying the 5,000 odd paper envelopes of the DNA labyrinth, I was too close to the work to even remember why it had seemed like something worth making. Later, a kindergarten class visited that space and they stood in a circle around the large mat of paper and string. And a little boy with a huge smile on his face looked at me and said, this looks like thousands of goodie bags. <laughs> and remembering his words brought me back to my dream about the unopened gifts and it came full circle thank you all right now I'd like to tell you a little bit about Tom Driscoll who's a local guy from Franklin Massachusetts 
As a child, he spent time in the woods, talking and debating with his father, playing with the next door neighbor, making a regular practice of recreating the entire 1967 World Series between the Red Sox and the Cardinals, just the two of them. I wish I could have been a fly on the wall to watch that. <laughs> now, Tom is an occasional guest opinion columnist for the Metro West Daily News and a frequent contributor to that paper's online, blo online blog, Holmes and Company. He maintains his own blog. He has written a novel and short stories, is a poet and performing songwriter. Tom has a CD of his songs called Guesses at Wisdom. And I can vouch, it's a great CD. He has also self-published two books of poems and songs. Do you have those available at the table back there, Tom? There's a bookmark so you can track down, but you have to actually available online. Okay, they're available online. Pick up a bookmark and buy one. Uh, be sure to check out his CD, his books, and his blog. And for now, pay real close attention to every beautiful word he has to share. Please give a hand to Tom Driscoll. I'm going to start with a, with a poem by Robert Bly called the, the Third Body. A man and a woman sit near each other and they do not long at this moment to be older or younger or born in any other nation or any other time or any other place. They are content to be where they are, talking or not talking. Their breaths together feed someone whom we do not know. The man sees the way his own fingers move. He sees her hands close around a book she hands to him. They obey a third body that they share in common. They have promised to love that body. Age may come, parting may come, death will come. A man and a woman sit near each other. As they breathe, they feed someone we do not know, someone we know of, whom we have never seen. That's a Robert Bly poem. And uh, talking of the webs of connectivity, that poem was actually uh, read at Denise and my marriage by the most excruciatingly hungover groomsman in the history <laughs> of matrimony. <laughs> and uh, I, what I liked about that poem, and it's funny, I, you know, I heard it, I heard echoes of it in some of the work that was even being read in the open mic beforehand, and is uh, the idea of that third body uh, and these connections and ideas that are surprises to us who even who are creating them sometimes because we're actually not the authors <laughs> you know um, and there's something just a, there's a duty in in speaking these things but also in listening and responding so I, I like the idea of talking about that third body coming here because uh, I wanted to really thank Cheryl and uh, so many of the people who participate in this because this is really kind of a body in and of itself. Um, you know, there's, there's aspects of thought that I borrow from this room all the time. Um, um, you know, I'll, I'm going to remember those two stones talking to each other in conversation that Polly was talking about. Um, and there's a way of communicating that happens here that doesn't even happen in normal, intimate family life. There's things Denise said today about her work that were like revelations just now. I was, there was, you know, things forming in me that I was like, I was, I was blown away. Anyway, so I want to, I, I guess my, I'm trying to trying to put together a theme, I wanted to talk about that sort of need to speak and to listen. Um, and I'll follow with a 
a piece of my own called uh, No Silence. I have emptied the silence, taken it from my mouth, from that long, song-shadowed place in beside my heart, from the colorless place behind my eyes. I have emptied it from the bare stones I had gathered and arranged, from the green leaves I had allowed to wither. I have traveled the streets of abandoned logic one last time. I have tasted the token smoke and bid farewell. I have visited the grave and remembered my father's expired voice, speaking his penitent name and listening for what he never said. I have emptied that silence. That sentimental spree has come to a close. And friends, I will not offer my own silence. I cannot. It has been replaced in me. I am left with this on my tongue, ash or earth. Each word displaces, displaces the next to call my language. I am changed to become something like the deeper, perfect soils that allow water to pass through, that make a place for seed and offer sweet, sheltered stillness. I will not mistake that quiet for silence, what is given to flower in the light. These col colors, my children, this song, I am joined to the resonant host. Hmm. I wanted, I guess, I thought of bringing this, bringing this piece out too because I, I do songwrite and write poetry and it's sometimes strange to figure out what the line between them is and also on the, this notion of things in a conversation, I feel it's perfectly okay to steal from one another too. So I going to read a poem that touched off a song in me. First I'll read the poem, which is by uh, a Russian poet by the name of Anna Akhmatova. And the poem's called Lot's Wife. And the just man <coughs> trailed God's shining agent over a black mountain in his giant track while a restless voice kept harrying this woman. It's not too late. You can still look back at the red towers of your native Sodom, the square where you once sang, the spinning shed at the empty windows set in the tall house, where sons and daughters blessed your marriage bed. A single glance, a sudden dart of pain stitching her eyes before she made a sound. Her body flaked into transparent salt, and her swift legs rooted to the ground. Who will grieve for this woman? Does she not seem too insignificant for our concern? Yet in my heart I never will deny her, who suffered, suffered death because she chose to turn. And so that, that touched off uh, this song for me. I am not chosen. It's not your fault. So say goodbye to your pillar of salt.
is the one, the one who turned. You talked of love to me and sweet things I sent bird the bird on the wing love he sings his song he's not the judge of who's right or wrong no he flies so high above love brings him down to the ground now in your history darling love seems to fade your song sing of the walls we made of the warmth of our bed of the laugh of a child things were real but you would not hold them no you walked away you walked away I am not chosen it's not your fault say goodbye to your pillar of salt just turn away love and leave me behind and let me pass from your heart to your mind was the one who turned. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I drank a lot of coffee this morning so I can read fast. This is the, the title poem from a, my, my self-published collection of poems <coughs> called Allow This Heart. Allow this heart music and it will unfurl a glorious banner, red and yellow fabric and bejeweled. Allow this heart light and it will utter profound words, giving names beyond seeking and beyond truth. Allow this heart breath in the sweet, cool air, and it will embrace even your simple permission. It will bless and absolve every fault. It will anoint the body and burn away the useless clothing. It will reveal what is beautiful as it has never been revealed. Allow this heart its place, which is all it has ever asked of you. But allow this, and history will fall from the pages of your books, 
the way scars might fall from healed skin, as ashes might from an offering offered in the wind. Even forgiveness would become such irrelevant dust. Eyes the color of burnt honey open toward you, the flower's petal and green leaf, the sky, all of these are certain of your joy and their purpose here at altar upon that bed and in perfect flesh. Yeah, I'm gonna, I, I think I want to skip the one other poem and go to one more song. Yeah. I was thinking of this song as a way to complete something of a circle because I know that with the Bly poem, he talks about just being present. And this song is about that sort of presence. It's called, uh, Are You Still Sleeping? Are you still sleeping, my darling? still wrapped up in your dream you know tonight there is a light the stars bring that says exactly what it means it does not shine with prayers or promise what it hopes to do someday it will not hold you and hurt you in the ways it tries to hold you and it will not choose to turn away given 
to love's foolish fallen son and I don't know where I've been until now and I don't know where I will go and I just know that I'm with I just know Is this a song about forgiveness? Is this a song to set us free? You and I, are we the victims or the witnesses? What can and cannot be And is this light The light of wisdom Of some truth From up above Is this a song Of salvation Or surrender is this the shining face of love? Well, I don't know where I've been until now. And I don't know where I will go. Well, I just know that I'm with you right now. So I know. That's it. Thank you. Moving on to Katie Frasinelli, who grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, where she loved riding bikes and playing make believe. Her make believe led her to a career in the San Francisco Bay Area, where she worked as an actress, director, and play developer with the award-winning theater company Shotgun Players. She met her husband Michael on the set there. He was the resident set designer. And they moved back east together and started a family. Now, that seemed to be the end of Katie's creative life as work, home, and kids took the front seat. I'm sure a lot of you women have felt this before in your lives. Then Michael gave her the gift of six guitar lessons last year. And then Katie wrote her first song last winter. When asked, Katie said one of her best moments sharing her music took place last year when she brought her mother here to wake up and smell the poetry and surprised her with a song written especially for mom. Katie feels she has finally found her voice as a singer-songwriter and is grateful for every visit from the muse since. Katie, I feel exactly the same. I'm so grateful when the muses deign to visit me. We look forward to hearing the song she has to share with us today. Please give a warm welcome to Katie Frasinelli. So, so this song uh, is one that uh, just sort of appeared for me. And I realized later that I, I did try to write it um, about a year ago after playing a benefit for uh, soldiers in Afghanistan and Iraq. And um, so when it arrived, I, I was glad to see it come back. <coughs> when I'm quiet in my dreams, I see life differently. You're a part of me I carry you with me everywhere I go Oh, they could never know How I love you so And I wonder, will you come back to me? And 
And if you do, will you be the boy? Crowds of people hurry by and let their babies cry. I want to ask them why, but I stand still and send up a simple prayer into the everywhere. I wish you weren't there, and I wonder, will you come back to me? And if you do, will you be the boy that I once knew? Greenish blue eyes and that sideways smile Could never tell a lie Baseball and apple pie Lying beside you in that summer heat Your kiss is soft and sweet And some things I can't repeat And I wonder to me and if you do will you be the boy that I once knew Um, so this next song I wrote, um, Michael will show you later some of the sculpture that he's made, and he was making this absolutely giant sculpture for a show that he did with Denise, and um, it required him to be gone in the studio about 22 and a half hours a day for weeks on end, <laughs> so I was a little lonely, and um, I was I was listening to the radio one day and, and Anna Devere Smith was doing a song called or a, a play called Let Me Down Easy and I heard that and I went mm, Let Me Down Easy huh and I was late of course so I thought, oh, I'll grab the guitar and um, I quickly wrote the first two lines of this chorus Let Me Down Easy Let Me Get Used to a Broken Heart and then I went okay well who who would say that and why um, and it it took me a couple weeks to figure out that. It was what I would say if Michael were to leave. Um, and being Michael, he would be really sweet about it. So this is my breakup song. <laughs> <laughs> you drift into our room like a fog at dawn. Don't we? you cross the room don't make me listen just leave me alone lying here in the dark let me pretend you're not gone let me down easy let me get used to a broken heart let me down easy I've been loved by you so long You slip into bed like a gentle breeze I slowly turn and melt right into you You hold me like you would never leave how can this feel 
so true Don't leave me alone lying here in the dark Hold my hand till you're gone Let me down easy Let me get used to a broken heart Let me down easy I've been loved by you so long My tears betray me as they fall on you Okay, tell me your secret I praise myself as you tell me the truth I look away and I say let me down easy Let me get used to a broken heart Let me down easy I've been loved by you So long So this last song is the one I was really excited to play today. Um, the, the words are actually a poem written by my great-great-grandfather, um, who is Ridgely Torrance, who, um, he was a playwright and a poet, and he wrote a poem in the 1920s for my grandmother. Um, he was in, from 1920 to 1934, he was the poetry editor of The New Republic. And he was the one who published a lot of the early works of Wallace Stevens and um, Robert Frost. And Robert Frost actually dedicated a poem to him called A Passing Glimpse, which is really beautiful as well. Um, so uh, published in 1925, not sure when it was written, but it was a song for my grandmother, Jean, and it's called Jean Singing. And I've always known about this poem, and she died actually five years ago, and at her memorial, the grandchildren each read a, a verse of it. And so the, the poem was sort of in my life, but I'd never really thought too much about it um, until a couple weeks ago, Michael and I went to my family's house to see my grandfather, who was turning 98. And um, he and my grandmother were so in love. I mean, they just had the most beautiful relationship. And he really misses her. And um, so uh, I'm getting ready to go see him. I'm blow drying my hair. And this little melody came in my head. And I thought, oh, that would make a be a little lullaby for the kids or something. So I put words to it and then hurried downstairs because I was keeping everyone waiting. And I noticed my mom had put out a copy of this poem. And so I just picked up and looked at the first verse and it fit this song perfectly. The, the melody and the, um, the rhythm and everything. And so I, I grabbed it and sang it to Michael on the way up to see my grandfather. And I'd always thought of it as a poem that um, was my great uncle, great great uncle, writing to my grandmother of how he would see the world through her eyes when after he died. And then it occurred to me that the poem is Jean singing, and now it seems more like my grandmother reassuring my grandfather that she's still really connected to him and that she misses him too. So uh, this is that poem. Lavender's blue in the garden, lavender's bright. When I am blind, my beloved, you shall have sight. I shall be dust in the garden, deep from the storm. You will be shining still, then you shall be warm. When I am hidden in shadow under the years, call to me 
tell me of all things heal among tears I shall remember the beauty filling this place the firebird calling through the rainbow lift up your face I shall remember how beauty over death, over birth. Bridges a streaming music here on the earth. Only if wounds and the sorrow made by men's hands still shall out deep in the waters dark in the lands even though you shall recall me then to your gleam i shall remember and turn me dream. Thank you. Thank you. Last but not least, Mr. Michael Frassinelli, who grew up in Stafford Springs, Connecticut, was interested in art at an early age, especially the fish and giant squid images from the National Geographic. Michael, I love squid. Squid and octopus the ones that change the colors and shimmer in the water. Oh, they're so beautiful. He also loved going out into the woods, collecting bugs and rocks and bits of junk. Presently, Michael teaches art and design at Dana Hall School in Wellesley, Massachusetts, where he is also director of the Dana Art Gallery. As an artist, he creates sculptures made entirely out of piano parts. Over the past five years, he has developed The Legend of the Pianistas, a fictional account of a lost North American culture known for using piano parts to create ceremonial objects and large-scale structures used for celestial navigation. The works are exhibited as artifacts in a natural history exhibit, complete with documentation, sound, video, and an illustrated catalog, as well as a good dose of dry humor. He was recently listed in the Metro West Daily News' Year in Review issue as one of the 10 best artists, the 10 best in arts and entertainment for 2008. Please help me welcome Michael Frassinelli. I'd like to start off uh, with a reading from a recently discovered copy of The Lost Tribes of North America. It was published in 1843. Of the thousands of tribes of North America, the Pianista peoples are the least understood. Archaeologists and historians offer differing opinions of the customs, social structures, and even the very existence of these very curious individuals. Named after their basic source of materials, the pianoforte, the Pianistas populate many different regions of North America, but are believed to have originated from Europe. Of the two prevailing theories, of their arrival to this continent differ greatly. Uh, one claims the first pianistas arrived quite recently, between 1500 and 1600 AD, in crude sailing vessels. Another theory suggests that several millennia ago, a land bridge existed that extended from what is now the toe of Italy to uh, Cape Cod, <laughs> and uh, that wandering clans would move herds of pianofortes with them to the journey <laughs> to the west. Um, for what has been uncovered, it is thought that the Pianista people survived solely on the pianoforte for everything but food. Ironically, the pianoforte is practically inedible. <laughs> uh, the resourcefulness with various materials found in the piano, wood, steel, ivory, ebony, leather, <coughs> felt, and copper, was matched only by their native counterparts on the Western Plains who utilized the American bison for their needs and some Arctic tribes, such as the Yupik and Inuit, who would catch seal and whale for their many uses. The pianistas believe that by destroying the creature, the piano, they could give it new life through everything it provided. Okay. 
So this whole mess uh, started about five or six years ago um, when Katie and I lived in Natick. And actually, I'm remembering the first time I saw Tom perform and uh, heard of uh, Denise that had a show at the time at the Danforth and met Cheryl, actually, at uh, T-Can when it was on a storefront uh, in Natick. So we had this uh, piano in our uh, apartment, and uh, we bought a house in uh, Houston, and we couldn't fit the piano. And it was out of tune and in bad shape, and no one would want to take it. So the long story short is um, she was out of town one weekend. <laughs> and so I stayed up all night uh, dismantling it and then boxed it up. And we actually moved all the parts into the shed of the new house. So that's true love letting your husband move a bunch of junk into a new house. But I had this idea, that aha moment, that I could take this apart and use absolutely every part to create sculpture from. And um, we'd recently taken a trip to Alaska, and so um, I'd seen a lot of uh, Eskimo masks that I was really interested in. I'd been introduced uh, years ago by a friend whose friends were, uh, who, who's a uh, parents were uh, uh, archaeologists, so I'd seen these, the image on the left. Um, so as I took this apart, um, the innards remind me of some of the materials that the Eskimos had used. Uh, the strings took on the look of these uh, wooden hoops that are uh, kind of a classic structure. They represent, um, in their concentric circles, the different circles of your existence, so from the universe to your, the land, to the village, to the family, and to the self. And so um, the other materials, the wood and the felt, um, the ivory keys remind me of a whale bone, and the felt hammers remind me of feathers. So I worked freely with the, uh, with the material, just creating objects, um, and they started taking on the look of these primitive artifacts. So the piano itself is about 100 years old, and so um, it has a nice patina. So the things, as soon as you make them, look old. Um, some of these things, I didn't uh, quite know what they were. Um, they're somewhere between masks and musical instruments and weapons. And they're sort of hybrid objects. Uh, some of these are more figurative and kinetic. Some of them wind up and dance. Um, some are kind of like human-animal hybrids. It's like a genetic experiment going wrong sometimes. <laughs> uh, so a story began to emerge that tied all these um, objects together. And again, the story of this, this culture called the Pianistas. Um, as the story continued to evolve, I find myself creating all kinds of ephemera around the culture. So doctored photographs, you know, uh, constructed uh, stories, um, and some things you might find in a natural history museum. So objects in glass cases, text panels with academic analysis of the history of the objects, those sorts of things. Of course, music was an important um, theme of the culture, so I made a lot of um, musical instruments that are actually uh, practical. And so it seemed natural to try to create music on these musical instruments. So I was uh, lucky enough to have some musician friends of mine who are here today. You might recognize them from the, the band photo. Uh, to collaborate on some traditional music. If we had more time, I would play some examples. But the, uh, the CD is available in the lobby. <laughs> um, it continues to evolve. Here's an example of a ceremonial costume that I created all out of piano parts. And so um, actually uh, there was a dancer that visited my studio who was very interested in doing a collaboration. And so um, uh, last November we performed live uh, the Amazing Things Art Center in Framingham. And so um, to this live music, this dancer created a traditional <laughs> dance performance for the harvest. Uh. Okay, so, so this series has been a lot of fun for me because I'm, I like all aspects of this art making, from the writing to the making of sculpture to, to making music. And so uh, since it 
represents a complete cultural history, um, you can incorporate a huge range of experiences that uh, any culture might have uh, over time. Uh, here's an example, um, and it takes some odd tangents, which I enjoy. Uh, here's the 19th century uh, biologist Ernst Haeckel making an appearance. He's noting the similarity between the microscopic organisms and these pianista dream images he called the pianolariums. You know, I'm working on my dissertation about this right now. So as artists, um, as Denise mentioned, uh, forms kind of follow you and kind of reemerge. Uh, songwriters, it happens as well. Um, but these circular forms started reoccurring. And so uh, this was a piece from a couple of years ago. It's a, it's a sun calendar. It's like a kind of a Mayan uh, calendar, but it has a, a very complicated uh, numerological system of, of keeping track of the seasons. Um, I can talk to you later about that, but um, <laughs> just think of the number 88, 4, plus 1. Yeah, anyway. um, so again, these circular forms continue. Then um, I'm making these kind of drawings of circles and different configurations. And then Denise calls me um, last year um, about a show that's going, she's curating about materials and process. And so here's a, here's a drawing I made in, uh, in response to her um, request and in addition to some things I've been thinking about. I've been wanting to make a shelter for a while because I'd done weapons and ceremonial objects and those sorts of things. And it seemed like one of those things you have to make. And so here's a drawing. It's actually made uh, with coffee that I did late one night. Uh, it eventually turned into um, this is the Pianista Observatorium. So this was at the show at the New Arts Center this past fall. Um, it's very big, and I had to take about 23 hours a day to build it for three months. Luckily, I'm not divorced because of it. Um, but it's set up to be um, like an observatory. You can see uh, the circular apertures in the structure from which you can look out to the various constellations, which would be displayed on the walls of the gallery and also functions as a meditation chamber. And so, um, again, these circular forms continue. In this case, here's a close-up of some of these, um, these objects I call uh, constellations. And so a lot of the work just comes from the material of the piano itself. So I have this whole overarching theme of this series, but it really always comes back to the material. What can this material do? What kind of objects can you create? And it, um, it, and it ties in with the story. Some things don't make the cut, but generally they do. Um, so the, the wheel forms recently have uh, inspiring me to um, create wagon wheels. <laughs> the idea was what could, be, um, what could be very large, kind of dangerous, take up a lot of space, which I don't have in my studio, and be very inconvenient to construct. <laughs> Um, so a covered wagon. Um, so I'm working on this that is a kind of a hybrid between kind of a shaman's vehicle and the wagons that are used by snake oil salesmen at the turn of the last century. And so um, uh, artists are always fascinated by their process and their new projects, so I'm showing off my baby right here. Uh, but the idea of snake oil was important because um, this whole story, obviously, is, is a kind of um, a bunch of lies <laughs> I'm trying to pull over on the public. Um, so I feel like I've descended, perhaps, from these snake oil salesmen. Uh, here's a, here's a, a view of the show at uh, Framingham I had in, in the fall. Um, but just to point out a few um, the ideas behind the work, and we talked about the creative process. And uh, it's really the transformation of these objects. So these pianos are generally about 100 years old. And uh, of course, in America, everyone used to have one in the parlor. It was just a piece of furniture that also made sound. And uh, people would make sound and sing around the piano. And it would hold old pictures and such. So um, as I think about when I'm working with these materials, I think about, first of all, where the material come from. So. Again, these are trees that are hundreds of years old, often grown for the very purpose of making pianos. 
um, then the sort of iron ore and copper that had to be mined and then formed into these objects. Then there's animal products, you know, felt uh, made out of wool from sheep that are long dead and uh, ivory from elephants that are thousands of uh, miles away. And all of these materials came together into this one object that also makes this beautiful sound. And so then I'm thinking about the history of the piano itself, so the people who made the piano, and then the people who bought the piano, and those who played it. And so um, I often think, how many songs have been played on these pianos? And this, this one key that I'm using, you know, whose grandmother, you know, played that E flat to play some old hymn? You know, that brought a tear to the eye of the, of the children. So it's, uh, this goes through my head. And then I entered the history uh, dismantling all this stuff and then uh, recombining it into um, objects that, um, alongside stories, take on sort of fictional quality. So it's just the regeneration of material, how uh, objects can turn into stories, can turn more into objects and, and further stories. Um, but I like the aspect of writing in, in addition uh, to um, to really um, make you believe something about an object. I mean, in museums often, you know, archaeologists and historians are... Are there any archaeologists in the audience? <laughs> okay. They're liars, and they're making stuff up. So, I mean, my, my question is, how can you know something about a culture thousands of years old? from a little shard of, of ceramic and create a whole cosmology around that. And then all of a sudden, it ends up on a tote bag at the museum. <laughs> That's just really strange to me. So anyway, this idea of juggling these objects and these stories were lies. Picasso said, um, art is the lie that tells the truth. And so uh, m my, wor my work is more or less trying to do that, making some fictional things happen to you know, create some, some feelings and some meanings. Um, speaking of misunderstandings uh, and lies, uh, so this whole culture I've been creating this, but a sort of a twist has arrived in the narrative. And so it's possible that this new twist might um, actually cast some doubt on the authenticity of the historical research about this tribe. So let me talk about this. Despite extensive physical evidence in the form of ceremonial objects, weapons, and other items, written accounts, field sketches, and notes from various sources found in numerous geographical locations across North America over the last 100, and year, 100 years or so, there exists in certain segments of the anthropological community some doubt as to the very existence of the Pianistas as a legitimate tribe. This debate has gone on since the first artifacts were discovered in the late 1880s. Um, as this catalog went to press, information that seemed to confirm this doubt came to light based on the discovery of a handwritten journal by a little-known and enigmatic figure in the history of the Pianistas called Alfonso Renato Veneto. Okay, he's an Italian immigrant who arrived somewhere near the turn of the century. Uh, Veneto, as it turns out, a piano tuner by trade, had a colorful background as, among other things, a saloon entertainer, a railroad worker, snake oil salesman, and a bit actor in early Hollywood westerns. In the journal, written in broken English and Italian, Veneto claims to have made the pianista artifacts that had been on display in the Chicago Field Museum as early as 1891. The journal, described as epic in length and in a style that alternates between self-aggrandizing poetics and confused ramblings, is said to be filled with sketches and notes and is stuffed with newspaper clippings of the period on subjects ranging from ethnographic exhibits to advertisements for dubious cure-all products. Uh, so whether or not this new twist in the saga of the Pianistas turns out to be true, it's just another example of the complexity and phenomena of a phenomenon that remains full of wonder. So my question is, is it more plausible that these artifacts were from a culture that has no written history or descendants, or that it was in fact an elaborate hoax perpetrated by a deluded and obsessive piano tuner turned <laughs> folk artist? We're gonna leave that to the art historians to decide. I wanna leave you with a, um, a quote. It's a traditional pianista 
farewell. All there is to know in this world cannot be known. Things of beauty and confusion are what make us most alive. May the music of mystery follow you like a hungry dog. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm going to read one of my Hopkinton poems. It's called Ned Chapman. And it's in his voice. This is Ned Chapman talking. Some visitors take those half-buried boulders for sheep. The way they lean in one direction toward the house. As a boy, I considered them bedrock rooted in the heart of the planet. And my children gave them names and called them mountains, Jackson, Blueberry, <coughs> Kilimanjaro. But they were boulders, still are, left by the last Pleistocene glacier, which dropped half of what it had been carrying on this town. On Bald Hill, the glacial boulders sit directly on Bedrock Ledge, where they talk on about the weather, rock to rock, about time, how it sneaks up when you're not looking, about the universe expanding, how we all arrive at raw new neighborhoods, minute by minute, even if we think we've always lived in the same place, even the selectmen. These boulders look like they've been here since Eden, but it wouldn't take much dynamite to raise them. I dug ditches with dynamite after the war, me and my brother, revising the landscape for a fee, a kind of mercenary force. And some evenings out here pulling witchgrass, I think dynamite might be a more suitable way to handle a garden. But the boulders stay. I mow around them. They aim to sleep here until the next glacier carries them another mile. Thanks. My oh my, were it not for the coffee bean, where would we be so serene and ever wired? The tempting aroma spills into the air with a sure sound of coffee grinding. The moment goes on forever through the misty expanse of the unknown. For no other reason than because we reach for the dark brown steaming broth in our solid ceramic mug, sipping slowly while sniffing away, imagining places afar a journey in our mind that we may never recall, just something that sure was. And once we reach half empty, or is it half full? The climax has been reached. No longer is the magic brew so hot and mystical. It just becomes one of many cups over the weeks, months, and years, seemingly routine, though never bland, something we need finish lest we waste, going through the motions like something merely statistical. Dear coffee bean, I must be in love with your brew. So warm and flowing as your gentle stream reaches within my tummy, my heart flutters, having thoughts so serene, escaping, immersing my head in your soothing bath, with not a care in the world other than my cup of you, at least for these eternal yet fleeting moments. My thumpy heart, it must be love. It can't be the caffeine. So the sun rises once again. The golden rays peek through the window. Another early morning, a subtle sheen. It's that magical time again. 
my oh my, were it not for the coffee bean. <laughs> and just to say thank you for Cheryl and for uh, carrying on and making such a wonderful place for all of us. I was a collage artist for um, an awfully long time. I worked with scissors and cutouts and published a lot, and then I wandered into the world of poetry, but often my poetry and artwork in was interwoven. I would write poems about artwork, and this is a poem um, really about my artistic process of my cutouts. Scissors, tape, and glue sticks line the cluttered table, and papers of many colors and sizes await. To warm up, I cut a few wiggling snakes. Then a few circles become inner spirals, the inward journey creating inner peace as a scissors journey within. Then stars, a focal point jutting out with many sharp edges, concentrating to keep points sharp and keep inner focus of middle. Moons are cut from circles too, besides spirals the most fun, slicing the edges of circles, keeping sharp narrow ends and full middles. My hands hold the scissors, expectant, curious to see what will emerge next, what boundary will be explored, feeling its edges as the two blades cross, as emerging lines define foreground and background, background dropping away a scrap as the shape appears. The scissors' sharp edge cuts into a new piece of paper, beginning a new space and shape. Becoming my big toe, I cut it, and then I feel my arch curve in and feel around the heel and in at the ankle and then up to more rounded calf. As my scissors cut the outer boundary of my leg, the extra space drops away and the outer shell of leg emerges. I continue on cutting sturdy thigh and widened hip, then in at the waist, curving again for rounded breast, up to armpit and out to outstretched arm and fingers, reaching out, each digit re reaching out. My scissors cut back down the arm and around a curving neck and out to define chin and ear and wispy hair. If the paper is folded in two, then I am done. I open up the paper to see mirrored sides becoming full woman, each arm and leg doubled, the symmetry of body clear. The woman struts out of the paper, her outer edge holding inward shape, sometimes coming out with attitude, other times cut as meek and mild. Reverence, awe, and wonder all expressed with cutout shapes, each woman cut becoming an entity in and of herself. Cutouts become a series of women of the night, white bodies against black starry skies with moon in different phases, young, old, and middle-aged, often symmetrical but sometimes not, but together become a parade of cutout women, a series of edges reveling in inner strength cut out from darkness. I wanted to uh, do two poems this morning. The, uh, one of them is a poem called The Rowan Tree, which is a poem about hope. And I, I'm going to preface that with a poem by John Keats, which is a prologue to a large poem of his called The Fall of Hyperion, and is his justification of his authority to write the poem, and as such, speaks to all of us about what we do. Uh, sharing the fruits of our imagination. Fanatics have their dream wherewith they weave a paradise for sect. The savage, too, forth from the loftiest fashion of his sleep, guesses at heaven. Pity these is not traced upon vellum or wild Indian leaf the shadow of melodious utterances. But bare of laurel they live dream, and die. For poesy alone can tell her dreams, with the fine spell of words alone save imagination from the sable charm and dumb enchantment. Who alive can say, thou art no poet, mayest not tell thy dreams, since every man whose soul is not a clod hath visions and would speak if he had loved and been well nurtured in his mother tongue. Whether the dream now purposed to rehearse be poets or fanatics will be known 
when this warm scribe, my hand, is in the grave. When I was still a child, without a sigh, without a yawn, I woke from dreamless sleep before a cold December dawn. My house was still and quiet, so I put my big coat on and escaped into a snow-filled night unnoticed. Down to the wood I walked. The trees were bare, yet seemed serene, where the queen of night bore down her silver. There she'd hung a screen. Then as I watched, revealed to me a clearing and a tree, lavishly adorned with leaves and crimson berries. And from every corner of the sky down to that rowan tree, the birds thronged to taste the bitter fruit it offered graciously. Those outstretched boughs, the scarlet berries speckling the snow, left a cinder burning in my heart, a secret that no one shall ever know. Though I am old, I still recall the night that rowan tree left its image here imprinted on my heart indelibly. And when I scan the long span of my life from then till now, I find nothing closer to the truth and nothing less than all God will allow. Thank you. My name is Mike Lowe. I'm going to recreate a speech of President John Kennedy. And this is a period of time where John Kennedy was not President of the United States. He was Senator Kennedy. And he was at Yankee Stadium, April 29, 1956. And the occasion was salute to Israel. So let's go back to Yankee Stadium. I join in this salute today because of my deep admiration for Israel and her people. An admiration based not on assumption, but on my own personal experience. For I traveled to Palestine in 1939, and I found there an unhappy land a land ruled by a League of Nations mandate, by a Britain which ruled and divided in accordance to ancient policy. While there, I was shocked by a British Foreign Office white paper just issued, sharply curtailing Jewish immigration. Yes, as in the days of old, the glory had departed Israel. For century after century, Romans, Turks, Christians, Muslims, pagans and British had all conquered the Holy Land, but none could make it prosper. In the words of Israel Zangwill, the land without a people waited for the people without a land. The realm where once milk and Honey flowed and civilization flourished. Was in 1939 a barren realm, barren of hope and cheer and progress, as well as crops and industries. A gloomy picture indeed for a young man paying his first visit from the United States. But 12 years later, in 1951, I traveled again to the land by the River Jordan, this time as a member of the United States Congress, and this time to see firsthand the new state of Israel. The transformation which had taken place could not have been more complete, for between the time of my visit in 1939 and my visit 
in 1951, a nation had been reborn, a desert had been reclaimed, and a national identity had been redeemed. After 2,000 years of seemingly endless waiting, Zion had at last been restored, and she promptly opened her arms to the homeless and the weary and the persecuted. It was an ingathering of exiles. They had heard the call of their homeland, and they had come, brands plucked from the burning. They had come from concentration camps and ghettos, from distant exile and dangerous sanctuary. They had come from broken homes in Poland and lonely huts in Yemen. They had heard the call and they had come. And Israel received them all, housed them, fed them, cared for them, bound up their wounds, and enlisted them in the struggle to build a new nation. Thank you very much. What Gore Vidal said. This is the old guy remembering the first line of his poem. <laughs> when you finally know the truth of life and love and all that stuff, Along may come a callow youth who thinks to call your bluff. Pray, speak little, if at all, lest your wisdom be purloined. Be like Gore Vidal, who cryptically enjoined. The meaning of this life? I know it. Yes, I do. I want it fair through stress and strife, but see no reason to share it now with you. <laughs> Well, I'm going to read about romance, and I believe romance is not only men and women in between. I believe uh, all our relationships that include creative jazz romance, so I'll read short poem and I will sing the same one. The romance seeds sprout in spring, grow lost into summer green, harvest on an autumn moon, dissipate into winter wind. Some romance never live through bitter winter. Friend, friend come and go, romance come and go, seasons come and go, life is never, never the same. It goes this way. Romance you see sprout in spring, grow and lost into summer green, harvest on an autumn moon. This fade into winter wind. Some romance never live through bitter winter. Friends come and go. Romances come and go. Seasons come and go. Life is never, never the same. I would like to thank you all for allowing me to be their host today. Thank you, Cheryl. Cheryl be, will be watching this. It's my first time ever hosting, and of course it would be in front of cameras. <laughs> Over. It's almost over. <laughs> Thank you to all of you who came out. It's, it's such a wonder to meet here once a month with such a group of wonderful artists and share our art with each other. Thank you for coming today. Let's give, your, give yourselves a hand.
tell the world how I was the History, darling, love seems to fade. And your songs sing praise of the walls we made. But the warmth of our bed, or the laugh of a child. 